Good morning. This is Very good morning, ma'am. Very good morning. Good morning, Upma. This is just to okay. check my voice. Yes, yes. And yes, yes. Connection uh, between. Diksha. Diksha, music is not coming. Diksha. Uh, yes, ma'am. It's going to come. Just a second. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Where are you? You're a disembodied voice. I am. No, I haven't, I haven't embodied. Okay. <laughs> Show us your body. <laughs> Here I am. Hi, Vajahat. <laughs> मेरे सपनों को जाने का हक रे मेरे सपनों को जाने का 
हक रे क्यों सदियों से टूट रहे हैं मेरे सपनों को जाने का हक रे मेरे सपनों को जाने का हक रे क्यों सदियों से टूट रहे हैं मेरे सपनों को जाने का हक रे मेरे सपनों को जाने का हक रे क्यों सदियों 
कानों से टूट रहे Very good morning to everybody. Begum Hamida Habibullah lived by the Tennessean ideal of to strive, to seek, to find, and not to use. It gives me immense joy to be hosting the very first Begum Hamida Habibullah memorial lecture. Before we begin, a small announcement for the audience. Audience, kindly post your questions in the chat box. You would be called to put your question to the speaker in the question answer round just after the lecture. Moving ahead with the program, I would now request Ms. Z. Vikaji, President of Adhya's Degree College, to deliver her welcome address. Am I audible? Is it, uh, th is the sound fine now? Yes, you are audible. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, we begin again, nonetheless. So, good morning, everybody. Begum Hamida Habibullah lived by the Tennessean ideal of to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. It gives me immense joy to be hosting the very first Begum Hamida Habibullah Memorial Lecture. Before we begin, a very small announcement for the audience. Audience, kindly post your questions in the chat box. You would be called to put your question to the speaker in the question answer round just after the lecture. Moving ahead with the program, I would now request Ms. Z. Vikaji President Avad Girls Degree College to deliver her welcome address. Oh. Next speaker, a person of the eminence of Miss Aruna Roy, an ex civil servant who has devoted and dedicated her life to the service and upliftment of the less fortunate. She has uh, set up a foundation, uh, works rather for the welfare of Mazdoors and uh, Kisans and has achieved 
wonders in her field ever since she's taken up their cause. It is a very neat cause and it is also a very fortunate thing that she has been selected today to commemorate the memory of a person of the stature of Begum Habibullah. When the Loreto Degree College decided to suddenly shut its suchers on 1975, uh, and the then chief minister decided that this college could not be just shut down without much ado. He requested that the Loreto hand over a status quo to another formed educational society. And very, very wisely, he gave the reins of that society to Begum Hamida Habibullah, who, as in her usual uh, active self, at that time, formed the Avad Educational Society and took over the Loreto Degree College status quo, where all of us, including myself, who had the fortune to be working at that time as lecturer in English, uh, prospered and the college grew from strength to strength. I was fortunate to have been closely connected with her. To begin with, she was someone known to my family and to me, primarily, she was always first and foremost, Auntie Hamida, and then of course, Begum Hamida Habibullah, and the chairman president of the Avad Girls Degree College, which post I am very proud to hold today, very much at her insistence and her calling. I am so happy that Ms. Aruna Roy accepted our invitation and that she's here with us on this first memorial lecture that we hold in honor of Begum Habibullah. And we look forward to all that she has to say. And also, uh, I welcome uh, Mr. Wajahat Habibullah and look forward to all that he has to say regarding Begum Habibullah and our college. Thank you so much and welcome everybody. Thank you, ma'am. I now request Dr. U. Chaturvedi, Principal, Avad Girls Degree College, to introduce us to the guest of honor and the speaker for the day. I'm sorry. I think uh, everybody can hear me now. Thank you, Thank you so much. A very good morning to everyone. It is my proud privilege to welcome you all to the first Hamida Habibullah Memorial Lecture. I welcome our guest of honor, Mr. Wajahat Habibullah, son of late Begum Hamida Habibullah, and our chief guest, Ms. Aruna Roy. Ms. Aruna Roy is a social, socio-political activist and founder member of Majdur Kisan Shakti Sangathan, National Campaign to People's Right to Information, and the School for Democracy. She was with IS from 1968 to 1975. And in 1975, she came to Ajmer District, Rajasthan, to work with SWRC and the poor. She was, uh, in 1987, she moved to live with the poor in a village called Dev, Dev, Dev Ungri Rajman district in Rajasthan. In 1990, she was part of the group that set up the MKSS. She has worked for accessing constitutional right for poor, right to information, employment, food security. She was a member of National Advisory Council from 2004 to 2006 and from 2010 to 2013. She was a member of steering committee of the Open Government Partnership till 2014. She is also the president of National Federation of Indian Women. Ms. Aruna Roy was this 2000, in 2016 professor of practice at, at McGill University, ISID. Montreal, Canada, and 2016, George Soros Visiting Practitioner Chair in CEU Budapest. She's been the recipient of several awards, including the prestigious Megase Award, 
the Nani Palkiwala Award and the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Award. She was listed as one of the 100 most influential people in the world by the Times Magazine for 2011. Thank you so much, ma'am, for taking out time to be with us today. I now request Mr. Vajaha Tabibullah to say a few words. Thank you so much. Sir, please unmute, yes. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, of course, you can. Uh, Dr. Ukma Chaturvedi, thank you for your introduction. Madam President, Zareen Bikaji, my friend and former colleague, Dr. Aruna Roy, guests and friends. It is, of course, a day of nostalgia to me as we celebrate the birth anniversary of my dear mother, who would have been 104 yesterday. But I'm grateful that I was able to spend so much time with her. As you know, she was with us till the year before last. And throughout her life, continued to contribute in one way or another, something that was very dear to her heart, which was the people of India, with her focus on women and children. Upmaji, is there some problem? You can't, you can hear me? Okay. Uh, now, I am particularly grateful to, as I said, my friend and former colleague, Aruna Roy, uh, for having accepted the invitation to deliver this first memorial lecture to honor my mother. Aruna and I joined the service together. In those days, she was Ms. Aruna Jaira, and we acted in a lot of plays together at the National Academy of Administration in Missouri. But our friendship formed then has continued and was further cemented by the fact, as mentioned by Upmaji, Arunaji was the primary mover of the revolutionary legislation which later came to be known and is today known as the RTI Act, the Right to Information Act. In the democratization of our country, of India, the RTI Act is said by some to occupy a place next only to the Constitution of India. The Constitution of India gave to India, as you all would know, a republic, a dem democratic, secular republic. But what the RTI Act did was to offer to the people of India a sense of participation in governance through the process of transparency and accountability. And that is why Barack Hussein Obama, on being sworn in as president of the USA, in his first speech to the administration, cited the fact, cited his Freedom of Information Act, the US Freedom of Information Act, along which, and ours, of course, is even more advanced than that, but B was based on the US Freedom of Information Act, to say that the Freedom of Information Act strengthens both governance and the citizenry alike. Why should he say that? Because through an instrument like the RTI Act, the people become participant in governance and therefore it strengthens both. 
So this was just an aside to explain my now abiding relationship with Miss Aruna Roy, who's also married to one of my school colleagues, Sanjeet Roy, known to the world as Banka. And the RTI Act, of course, is only one among many of her achievements which have been described by my So let me come to the appropriateness of her being chief guest, her being the first to deliver the first lecture on this anniversary of my mother. My mother, like her, started her career as the wife of a senior army officer and her contributions in the building and the ambience of what is now the premier military training institution in India and among the, world, the, the, the foremost tri-service academies in the world, the National Defense Academy is now legend. Similarly, Aruna started off by being part of government. Of course, I, people like myself, persisted, continued to be in government. She left the government because she felt to serve the people, she needed to be outside the government. Similarly, my mother, on the retirement of my father from the army and from his subsequent government appointments, went on to the service of the people. Entering politics was one way of serving the people, but the objective remained always clear. So the peak of her career post-retirement was certainly as president of the Indian Council of Childhood where she was able to bring about a lot of change and reform in services available to the women and children of India. Similarly, Aruna focused on what she has described, or what you have described, Bapmaji, as the Mazdoor Kisan Teva Sangathan. But this is not really focused as my mother was not very focused simply on women and children, Arunaji has not been focused simply on Mazur and Kisan. What she has been focused on, and I'm proud to say that, having known her for so many years, is the people of India. And this, I think, is the appropriate reason why I find it so appropriate that she is delivering this lecture, because we all, our primary concern are the service of our people. The service of all people, yes, but certainly beginning with the service of our own people, and that is the service of the people of India, notwithstanding language, color, race, ethnic background or whatever. We are all proud citizens of this country, India. She, and in a smaller degree, I have helped to build what is today. The country, the world envies and prides itself on as being not only the world's largest democracy, but a beacon light to those aspiring for freedom and democracy across the world. And people like Begum Hamida Habibullah, people like Aruna Roy, are the lights which light up that beacon. So let me thank Aruna for having joined us today. And I know you'll be looking forward to listening to her, so I shan't take more of your time. I don't wish to say anything more about my mother's background. All of you know that perfectly well. Her association with Aruna was, of course, through the All India Women's Federation, of which, as has been mentioned, Aruna was to become head. And now I look forward to hearing what Aruna has to say. And as you might know, as you, as you wouldn't know, but you should know, she has always been, in many ways, my teacher, although she's a little thing 
and you would imagine that she she on she has she has very little weight to pull, but it's her mental weight with which she dominates all her colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I now request the speaker of the day, Srimati Aruna Roy, to take over the reins of the program. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Diksha. Uh, the president, uh, Ms. Vikaji, the principal, Dr. Yu Chaturvedi, uh, Vajahat, his family, of who are friends and I've known them for so many years. I'm deeply honored and I'm really humbled by the kind of description you've given of me. I have, of course, no opinion of myself and I feel that I'm an ordinary human being, much as many who have peopled this country and contributed to its tremendous growth. But I've had the greatest admiration for Dr. Hamida Habibullah and it's an absolute honor to be invited to begin the series of memorial lectures with this small contribution to her memory and of her immense personality, which is so multifaceted and fascinating. Uh, Hamida ji and I happen to incidentally be members of the National Federation of Indian Women. And when I was offered to hold the notional position of a president of the National Federation of Indian Women, um, because the general secretary does all the work and the president is a support to the general secretary by Ani Raja. I joined and for me, these years, six years have been very fruitful years, apart from the many other things I have done. And it gave me my first, the first occasion was created for me to meet Hamida ji when she came 10 floors up at the age in her nineties to attend a meeting uh, of the National Federation of Indian Women. But we must know that she has, has been very active, particularly in 1975, but during and after the International Women's Year. From 60s, she was part of the national leadership. She worked as vice president of the NFIW for 15 years, and she was one of the patrons till her very last. I think apart from what I have mentioned, I've also read fascinatingly that she did so many different things. She went to the college in Putney in London. She trained to be a teacher. She was also a member of the social welfare programs. She was a member of the All India Congress Committee. She returned, she started the, she initiated this Avad Girls Degree College, which I didn't know was part of Loreto Lucknow, which was so famous. And she has been president of so many organizations. She has founded Save, she founded and she became president of Seva Lucknow. She was so many things, but the most interesting thing I found was that she also was interested in the mango orchards in Sedanpur and cultivated the sheris and chosas and langras and safeda, the mangoes which we taste with so much love and with so much joy. I think what when I read about uh, Begum Hamida Habibullah, though I did meet her at Bajaj's place many times, but when I did read about her recently, the thing that struck me most was that we women are really live multiple lives. We don't lead a singular linear life in which it goes from one to the next. And I think some of the reasons why we, when we come to public life, we become much more than what we might have been as housewives or as domestic women is because we bring to bear a facet of our character as, as of our sexuality and our birth that we get interested in multiple things. We are multitaskers, we get interested in multiple things. And I think uh, Habida Ji leads uh, the huge band of Indians and Indian women who contributed to the great, great country that we call India. I'm really a humble uh, and small uh, follower of her multiple parts. And I hope that in this today's lecture, I'll be able to draw upon some of my current concerns and they are all about democracy and the way our democracy is going today and how we the people 
are the we people when we shape democracy, we create it in a humane fashion with all the humanist principles and a compassion that women are known to actually possess somewhat mistakenly biologically. I think compassion is equally uh, an attribute of men, but somehow women have been attributed the role of compassion. I would like to go back a little bit in history to uh, the uh, period when actually uh, she was in her, maybe in her early 20, early teens, and she's, she's a generation older than I, and I was barely born and Vajahat was barely born, when India became an independent country and set for itself this task of building a republic. And it's interesting to know that our constitution begins with we, the people of India, and inclusive as it is, and, it's just, and it states very clearly that it will be a secular country, it will be a country which will offer equality, liberty and fraternity to all its citizens, regardless of creed or regardless of caste, regardless of gender. Despite its very tumultuous past, and we've had a very variegated history, and I come from the south of India, which has had a distinctly different history from the history of the north of India, the land known as Hindustan has welcomed different communities and religions. In chairing the Constituent Assembly, Dr. Ambedkar, with Nehru and Gandhi, chose a secular framework against some opposition. But our secular constitution is for everybody. It's an inclusive constitution. It's an inclusive country, or should be an inclusive country, uh, despite some of the efforts that have been made recently to make it much more focused on one major community. We should fight regardless for the shared culture that we are so proud of. Democracy as a concept is a, has a universal relevance. And we might argue that it's come from outside of India. But if we look at primitive societies, if we look at old cultures, if we look at old societal formations, the principles of democracy are very old and are universally shared by many countries across the world. Indian culture is inclusive. We know that whether it's Bismillah Khan or whether it's Veena Dhanam or whether it's uh, uh, Subramanya Shastri or it's somebody else, we mix our music is composed of contributions by people across the board. And if you look at folk culture, folk culture is the contribution of uh, equally of Anwar Khan Manganihar and of art of Mirabai. You cannot say to us that you are particularly of one culture or the other by just by defining our religious origins. And I think today we are fighting a battle to establish once again our shared and wonderful past where we fashioned what is today called India. It's mistakenly many of us think that secular defines our own personal religion and we fail to understand that it actually defines the nature of the state. The state will not allow either any one of these divisive forces to define its relationship with its citizens. And it is with this that right to information actually was born. And in light of right to information, I would like to go back a little bit to tell you how it took advantage of many of the historical factors of what we call India. In the early 90s, we began uh, liberalizing and we, broke away from some of the norms of a self-contained society we had before, and we brought in a fair degree of Western and outside multinational influences came to India. And in that sense of history at that time, there was a fear that people who were part of the old welfare state concept with Nehru and, uh, and, and had introduced to India, where we had a welfare state, which meant that we had a, a, a planning commission, we had a mixed economy where we had people sharing the profits of this country in a manner in which the poor were not ignored because when India became independent, there were two major concerns. The first concern was the concern of the poor and the marginalized, which was poverty and under, underdevelopment. And the other one with the scars which were left by the partition that we would have a country where religion would no longer play the havoc that it had done in the past. So when we looked at the concept of the welfare state, the welfare state promised its poorest people 
a say not only in, uh, in the matter of its own economic development, but a say in deciding what it could do or not do by making the planning commission have five-year plans, which were public information and where you had not only information shared with the people of this country, but where there was a charter of a federation so that you shared your information with other states and therefore nothing in this country could be done arbitrarily. Democracy actually, as Vajahat said, is participatory and it has to have people's voices and the famous Abraham Lincoln definition, I don't have to quote over and over again to you. And as you all are very well-read people, you know that he said of the people, for the people and by the people. So the people should be in the center of decision-making. And it felt at that time that because of the influence of neoliberalization, does this country would somehow become much more focused on issues of progress or of growth at the cost of its poor people, at the cost, at the cost of participation and of nation building, which should come from below. As part of the Mazdur Kisan Shakti Sangatan, we were very, very concerned that actually beginning with the early 90s, when actually we had uh, multinational companies making their first appearances in India, that we would lose our control over ourselves. What actually really gave us tremendous strength was the nature of the welfare state and of the democratic system where we still had a voice and that voice had to be strong and powerful. If I can go back to a small or couple of stories about what happened when uh, we fought for this battle, when we fought this battle for information. Uh, the first time we went to ask for simple things, we went to ask, what does a peasant want? He wants decent uh, wages, uh, regular wages that are sanctioned by the state. And when he works or, or she works on a work site and wants proper regulated food items. So we went and so the food and work and employment are the primary concerns. So we saw that when people worked on work, government work sites, they were not paid what is a statutory minimum wage prescribed by the state. So it felt that it was a gross violation. And when we asked to see the records of that, of the of the uh, of what are called muster rolls, where people's names are written down, they refused to show it to us, and from there began a huge campaign. And but these ideas came from ordinary people as well. And I have been uh, where I feel a little uh, embarrassed that I'm given attributed this claim to have found this sub from somewhere. Actually, I discovered this whole process with hundreds of hundreds of fellow beings. And I'll just quote you uh, what uh, my friend, uh, one of my friends who was a poet and a lyricist, Mohanji said when we first discovered that there were always many versions to the truth. When we said we worked for eight hours on the muster rolls, the records showed that we hadn't. And he said, unless these muster rolls come out, unless all information comes out, we will always be liars. And he said it in his local language, but in Hindi, he wrote a song I mean, and I'll do the translation in Hindi. He wrote a song, he said, when he said, Pehle wale chor bhai banduk se maarte the. Aaj ke chor to kalam se maarte hai raj choron ka. So he said that the kalam, the idea of the kalam being the way in which we all lose our independence and our freedom today, the freedom from hunger, the freedom for to work, the freedom to operate as people who can claim education and health, he defined by kalam. The kalam is the main issue. So the records of the institutions, the records of all democratic processes became vital and we asked for the right to see those documents. But all these rights today, which I feel we claimed with so much ease in the uh, in the 90s and the early 2000s when we actually got the law would not be possible today because today expression of dissent and expression of even the right to access something in the villages of Rajasthan and the villages of India is under wrap. At one level, all freedom of expression today is viewed with deep suspicion. The act of questioning, which is what will give birth to the right to information, Hamara paisa kahe, the right to ask a question, that right to question is being threatened today at various levels, including the lowest level when with for working for MGNREGA, 
when laborers went to ask for the right to see the demand sheet because they can demand for work. They wanted to see the registration of their demand. They were taped, there they were, they were FIRs were uh, registered against them. And we had to have a huge battle to establish that people who demand work under a statutory law like the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which gives them the right to demand work, the right to get a signed receipt. They are not going against the law, they are with the law. So today we are with our backs against the wall, fighting for the right to, fighting, fighting for our rights, which are legal rights and fighting for the right to ask questions. The right to information actually did an extremely important thing that it established the legality of the right to ask questions and the justiciability of, of, of uh, going further forward when we were denied that information and Bajat occupied the post of the central chief and central information commissioner where he sat in judgment on many of the cases where we were denied information. So unless you have a concept like a welfare state or a concept of a real democratic state where there's participation or the concept of equality as a value, RTI and the questioning of government would simply could not have happened. I sometimes think that if we mobilize today, first of all, can we mobilize today? Because of COVID, we are all trapped in our homes. Because of COVID, we can't assemble on the streets. Because of COVID, there's section 144. And because of COVID, we are trapped. But we're also trapped because of the suspicion. Because if you ask a question which questions the impunity of the state, you are a criminal. Actually, the criminal goes scot free. And people who ask questions of the criminal are being defined as anti state and often behind bars. So, in this quixotic situation, what has really saved us has been participatory democracy, and even today, to some extent, the right to information law. If you look at institutions, the great, great, when they, at the turn of the century, and I mean, at the, when we got our independence, and when we really became a nation state, institutions were created, and institutions are created by any power structure to keep monitoring itself. And that's how a healthy democracy works. If you want to be a healthy democracy, you cannot claim that all you do always will always be right. You have to be careful not to make any mistakes. So we had a controller and auditor general left by the British. We had commissions which we created, the Women's Commission, the, we created the Information Commission, we created the Human Rights Commission and so many other commissions, which we looked at, which looked at the state's performance and used the rights given to us by the Indian constitution under the fundamental rights to monitor the rights that were given to us under the directive principles of state policy to form free associations and under the, under the fraternity that we were guaranteed by the constitution to form associations to make sure that the constitutional values kept, were kept alive and on online. So today in this quixotic situation, the right to information still operates. And we have more than 60 to 80 lakh people who ask questions in this country today, every year. So it's not a small, small thing. And the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which the Prime Minister did not like very much, and said in 2014, that he would keep all these rights based laws as examples of the failure of the last government have come to his rescue. Because without the NGNREGA, with this tremendous reverse migration that has taken place, people would not have got work. 30% more than last year, they have had to provide work. And we have more than 29 crores of Indians, uh, core households of Indians, working to survive under the NGNREGA. How did these rights-based laws become possible? Rights-based laws became possible because with a government that recognized both the fundamental rights and the directive principles of state policy of a constitution with a government, UPA one and two, where in the government recognized also that it had an obligation to perform. So it brought out a document called the National Common Minimum Program and the National Common Minimum Program made a promise to its people. 
after winning a, a, the election, not before, saying that we will give you these laws, we will give you these various uh, uh, various uh, amendments to various rules to make the country a better country. And in that national common minimum program, the elected government gave its people the promise of bringing a better right to information law. It was at that stage, after many state laws had been passed, after our great fights and struggles, many state laws had been passed, and the government of India then set about giving us a strong, powerful right to information law and to, and to, set, or, and to set aside a previous Freedom of Information Act given by the previous government. To really bring it down to the people's level, I will just go back to a story. In 1996, when the Mazdoor Kisan Shakti Sangatan and the National Campaign for People's Right to Information convened a press conference in Delhi. And in that conference, there was Sushila who had just passed her fourth class. She was also there. And in that conference, the reporters asked her, Kitni padi ho tum? So she said, Main chauti paas. So they said to her, Are bade bade log kuch karni paaye aur tu chauti paas aake ye sushna kadikar ka kanun mana legi. So she said to them, and this is so wonderful a story, she said to them, I apne bete ko das rupya dekar bazaar bejti hoon, aur wo wapas aata hai to mein hisab leti hoon. Ye sarkar mere naam se arbo kharbo rupay kharch karti hai. Mein hisab nahi loongi kya? Wo hamara paisa, is liye hamara hisab. It was such a powerful statement, hamara hisab, hamara paisa, that it became a slogan. And in four words, Sushila described the entire right to information campaign, placed it in the center of democratic participatory democracy, where people matter and where a system functions for the betterment of its own people, just as Hamida ji worked for the betterment of people through institutions. We have to look at how institutions can be used and how structures can be used to scale up the benefit for people. And she rightly put the individual complaint in the center of a large structure where it became accountability of an elected government to its own people. We must also understand that Gandhiji's last man, whom he described as the person you must think of when you uh, plan a program of, uh, of benefit or of development, that last person has to somehow get benefit from this entire program of, of law or any legislation we pass, what happens to that last person? And it's in keeping in mind <coughs> the most vulnerable of uh, the most vulnerable of the communities that we work for, that the right to information in the MGA and RGA, which have been laws uh, scaled up by the institution of the government and the state to benefit so many hundreds of thousands and crores of people and households. We must understand too that scaling up is important. People like me who left the government and started working in small spaces uh, tend somehow to lose sight of this need for scaling and see scaling only in the civil society world, but that cannot be. The largest organization working for people is the government and the government has an obligation to do so. What the right to information was able to do was to force upon the state the nature of its obligation to perform for us, or all of us, what it should have done on its own. And in this, the participation, the process of participation, how you participate is also be to lay down and there are rules for participation, otherwise you will have mayhem. So you have to have a law, a legislation, you have to have rules and you have to have structures which, through which such a, such a benefit comes to its various people. I briefly taught in, uh, in McGill for four months. And when I went there, they asked me to introduce myself in two minutes. And I thought to myself, how will I in a completely different cultural environment introduce myself in two minutes? And I was a bit uh, worried. And then I thought, let me just tell them that I'm part of two major campaigns in India. One is the right to information campaign, if which there are 60 to 80 lakh users every year, that's six to 8 million users every year. And I'm part of another campaign for rural employment, which looks at and gives employment to 2.9 billion people every, every year. 
so million people every year. So 2.9 million people get work and the scale of it, and that's so I said, well, I'm here and we can talk about it later. But the tendency to uh, reduce work into its most minimalist form or reduces it or to extrapolate it to its most absurd largeness, both have to be avoided. And I think it's in that that participatory democracy has its strongest and biggest roles. I will uh, end it, my, uh, my lecture with a little bit on how we are facing multidimensional inequality these days and how as women we have always faced inequalities. But today the inequality has become intersectional. We face inequality as Dalits, we face inequality as minority communities and the greatest tribute to uh, our nation in terms of its civil mobilization and its potential has been the Shaheen Bagh and the, and the other protests that followed using completely what Gandhiji would have called satyagraha or civil disobedience. And in this process established so many wonderful things. And for me, Shaheen Bagh, where I did go once has been a symbol of bringing democracy alive back again as a participatory process. It brought in women who led the fight. There was no single leader. It was collective leadership. They brought in the constitutional rights. They brought in the issue of the right to question, the right to dissent, and the right to ask for an answer. For me, there has been no other greater performance of civil society power in recent times than these protests. And I'll quote Radhakrishnan, Dr. Radhakrishnan, who was part of the Constituent Assembly as I will, when he says, and he warns us before we actually even become a fully operational country, that we must beware of our national faults of character, our domestic despotism, our intolerance, which have assumed different forms of obscurantism, of narrow-mindedness, of a superstitious bigotry. And today our opportunities are great, but let me tell you that when power outstrips ability, we will fall on evil days. This was his warning to all of us. In India, there is a rape every 15 minutes and we have been ranked as one of the most dangerous countries in the world for women. We also have to understand that to fight these various anomalies, one has to have the power to dissent and the power to, dis to disagree. If one doesn't have the power to disagree and dissent, India ceases to be the kind of republic that we imagined it would be when we started the dream of India, which is the Indian constitution. Actually, I feel that the Indian constitution and the Indian dream are kind of correlated in a very intrinsic manner. Today, what are the biggest challenges as we face ahead of what has we know as India? One is to fight the narratives that are doing the rounds, saying that India has been a majoritarian country it has never been a majoritarian country. India has been a country in which there has been, for the sake of description, a majority and a minority, but we have all lived as equal beings. We have to fight for a battle against regressive ideology, which is crucial for the existence of us as women and for an idea of a democratic, socialist, secular India. There can be no question of separating any one right struggle for any right from the larger democratic rights of a secular India today. Secular India is vitally important for many of the things that we are struggling for in our individual campaigns. And when we slip into worry and, to, and into inaction, uh, I always will recall the words of Mahatma Gandhi when he said to us, when I despair, I remember that all through history, the way of truth and love have always won. There have been tyrants and murderers, and for a time, they can seem invincible, but in the end, they always fall. Think of it always. Today, I will end my, uh, my tribute to uh, Mrs. Habibullah by saying that she led us in her multifarious facets to an India that was pluralistic, in India that was tolerant, that in India that was full of compassion. And if today we need to get India back to Kiel, we have to be as courageous as she was and take on issues that might seem confrontational, 
that might seem contentional, but which are intrinsic to our well being as human beings. We have to bring in a world of compassion and a world of love and understand that as women, we have a primary role in spreading compassion and love to all human beings. And if compassion and love are opposed, we have nonviolence as a process to fight the, the struggle for compassion, which is an irony, but to first struggle to fight for compassion and for love. And we also have to understand that the Indian Republic has to survive. The Indian constitution has to survive. The, the preamble has to survive as it is today. And all the values that we have inherited through the constitution have to be protected. And in her various roles, whether she was in government or outside, whether she worked with women or with children, or she worked with education, she showed us that it was possible to scale up activities, to work for these issues through institutions and through structures as much as outside. I wish all of you a, a great year ahead and many years ahead. I also wish the college successes from year to year. And I thank the Habibullah family uh, for inviting me today to speak to all of you. I've kept my, uh, my discourse short so that you, we can have time for questions and answers and discussions that you may like to follow up with. And I thank Vajahat, especially a very dear old friend of whom I have the greatest regard and respect. And I've learned from him the values of compassion, the values of humaneness, and the values of tolerance as I have not learned from anybody else. When faced with public criticism, they can be no more dignified and no more gracious person than Vajahat Habibullah. So as I end, I want to say that Begum Habibullah will be proud of the family she has left behind, of Vajahat, of her children and her grandchildren. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your thought-provoking lecture. And thank you for helping us understand the concept of a welfare state better. Now, moving on, now we would like to begin our question and answer session. I request Rupal to come for forward and ask her question. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Ma'am, thank you for such a thought provoking and insightful lecture. Uh, Ma'am, my question is that what uh, inspired you to work for the implementation of Right to Information Act during such and difficulties you must have faced? Like uh, Begum Habibullah, who she pursued a dream, I pursued my own. Uh, worries and problems made me pursue this path which led me to the right to information. I've always been concerned with uh, two things. One is oppression of people uh, for various reasons, for having been born in a particular caste, of being poor, about being religious, with, for religious differences, and for so many things. And, and remember that I was uh, at the time of partition already at one year old. So for me, religious discrimination, all these things were totally unacceptable. But my parents also told me that if you are bothered by something, and I also had a wonderful mother and a great father who said that if you are perturbed by anything that disturbs you, you must do something about it. So how do I do something about it? The first time I thought perhaps within the civil service, I might be able to do something. Bajahat could do something, but my temperament was not Bajahat's temperament. So I felt that I would like to work directly with people. And in working directly with people, they taught me all my skills. They led me to where I am today. They made me understand optimism in the most dire circumstances. They made me understand the graciousness, graciousness of offering their last roti, sharing their last roti when they are hungry with, with a person who dropped in on them like me. And I understood that unless people like they shape policy and they shape development, it is not going to work. No one sitting in Delhi can shape policy. Policy and law will have to be shaped by the people who will suffer the consequences of that law. So I started listening to them for 30, 40 years. I've listened to them. They've always brought wisdom. And Mohanji's words, as I said, when he said, record bahar nahi aayenge, hum hab 
and the jhoot is not just jhoot in a moral sense jhoot means no food jhoot jhoot means children don't go to school jhoot means no education so if you're denying a wage to a worker you're denying them life so that's what made me so determined to fight for the right to information because i saw the right to information as right to life and prabhash joshi a very well known journalist hindi journalist said hum janenge hum jiyenge he came to us he went back and wrote an editorial in jansatta hum janenge hum jiyenge janna aur jeena bilkul itna ganisht tarike se ek dusre ke upar sambandh rakhte hain ki bina jaane jeena mushkil hai to jeena itna buniyad hai to that's why wajahat said next to the constitution the right to information law because it really gives you that that single little bit of help and support it's the the, the rope you throw a, a person sinking who can catch the rope and climb on right back to demand their rights as equal citizens of this country thank you ma'am i now request amna to ask her question good morning ma'am and uh, ma'am uh, my question is that like in rajasthan like you worked for 36 years and uh, did a lot for the people there with the help of the rti so ma'am my question is that and today also you mentioned about the minimum wages that people are not paid minimum wages according to their uh, work measurement of work so ma'am my question is that why is it so that people are not paid according to their wages it's a very complex question but i'll try and answer as uh, within when you probably can read up a little more there is a law called the minimum wage act which we gave ourselves in 1948 that for 8 hours of work you must be paid a minimum wage now this is a law in the entire country but uh, the wage is which the wage the amount of the wage is uh, determined by every state separately depending on this consumer price index now but in government's own programs they don't pay the wage because of corruption there are two things that make this a problem for people one is absolute corruption and corruption includes inaction if it also includes non performance then that's a simple bureaucratic reason for for uh, non payment because if you give work to a person and in no where is minimum wage in government works paid without a quantum of work that has to be given this itself is a contradiction because according to wage uh, according to the wage concept of the wage you either have an 8 hour wage or you have a piece rate wage a piece rate wage when you say you stitch one kameez and i'll give you 8 rupees an 8 hour wage you stay here for 8 hours and i pay you the wage whether you work or not is somebody else's business because they have to make you work what government does is it does both piece rate and wage rate it gives quantum of work but when the quantum of work is given the junior engineer seldom goes to measure out the amount of work that is needed to be done and then when they measure they don't measure actually physically they sit in their rooms in their bdo's office and arbitrarily decide how much money to give so the worker stops working finally so it leads to a disaster in terms of economic development as well as the minimum amount of money that is need for economic sustenance so what we demand is that and that's where we fight for mg nrg as well i mean we also as much part of the mg nrg campaign as we are part of the rti campaign and we demand that there must be self selected groups of people who say pura kaam pura dam that we will fight for both pura kaam bhi rahenge aur pura dam bhi lenge and there the unionization the concept of coming together to understand that it's our own development that we are building our own tank bed or we building our own school that spirit has to also come in but the reason i would say for non payment of wages is its corruption but today we have another horror they are trying to set aside the minimum wages act which means you can hire anybody and give them 50 paisa a day and if that person is in need will have to work for you today the rajasthan minimum wage is 200 and 30s something but if you pr- to take away the wage people will be hired for 50 rupees and 60 rupees what the minimum wage also does is it keeps the balance of the market wage so the market wage cannot fall below the minimum wage i'm sorry i have taken so much uh, to explain so much of it 
but it is a very, very contentious and very complex issue. I hope you'll read up about it, my dear. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I now call upon Akriti to ask her question. Good afternoon. And my question is uh, that is definitely form of government suitable for all the countries because uh, in many countries we have seen that Akriti, you are not audible. Can you be a little louder or we can relay your question? Ma'am, am I audible now? Yes, perfect. Yes. yes. Uh, Ma'am, the question is uh, that is democratic form of government suitable for all countries? Because in many countries, we have seen that democratic government has failed. Uh, the failure of democracy is, I'll have to perhaps spend a couple of days with you to talk about how democracies have failed. Uh, for me, democracies have failed because they've ceased to be democracies. They have not failed because they are democracies. When they cease to be democracies in principle and process, they of course fail. But that's because they're not democracies. If you are a real democracy, you cannot fail. Because why is it then that it's such a popular form of government the whole world over? Because whenever even the people who don't practice democracy want to say they are democracies, why is it so? Because it's the only system which guarantees equality. It, it guarantees participation through the vote for every individual. It guarantees economic equality for us in India. It guarantees social equality for us in India. It has not failed. We have failed. We have failed to understand that we as, as citizens have very important roles to play to make this democracy work. We have to understand that this democracy must be monitored. That's why the right to information, because through the right to information, when the democracy is made to fail for private ends, for the benefit of some individuals, people who are democratically minded, truly democratically minded, public spirited, can ask questions to find out why is it that this democracy, which is supposed to service me, is not servicing me? Whom is it servicing and for what reason? So democracy means hard work. It means not hard work in the sense of giving up everything, but it definitely means that every individual who's a citizen must raise their voice against the, in the negatives of democracy. Yesterday I was in a seminar and there an extremely learned political analyst of India said that actually what we need is social push to keep democracy going. And we need a normative structure to be everybody's structure. Everybody has to have that normative structure. When corruption comes in, the normative structure is corroded. And for that push, everybody is to feel the need for equality, the need for liberty, the need for fraternity, to make this country an equal country for everybody. But it is for everyone. And in India, the poor work it more than the rich do. For the poor, they realize that democracy means a right. It means firstly a political right, which they never had before, of being able to say to anybody who comes to their door, I won't vote for you or I'll vote for you. But it also gives them the right to demand through that vote a better life. So for them, democracy is critically important. But for people who are slightly more affluent, we tend to forget that the democracy affects us also in terms of employment opportunities, in terms of jobs, in, keeping, in terms of keeping the rule of law going, in terms of keeping a safe environment, of keeping the environment, pr protecting the environment in multiple ways that democracy is important. As a woman, it's critically important to me because it's the only political system that gives me equality at one stroke with the other gender. It tells me that I'm equal to a man. But if I didn't have democracy and the kind of democracy we have in this country, I would always be a second class citizen and I'm not willing to take it. So there are two famous feminist slogans. One is my life is a revolution. Because every time I do something or I take an opinion or I do uh, take a decision, 
I have to fight because I'm a woman. My life is a revolution. The second is my personal is political because I fight a battle which is a personal battle, but it's a political battle. If you look, look at uh, Begum Hamida, Habibullah's life, or you look at our lives, then we are always taking that personal issue outside. Why can't girls be seen in public? Why should girls always be in Parda? When I mean Parda, I don't mean physical Parda. I mean metaphorical Parda, that we have to disappear from the scene. Why is it that we cannot do some of the things? Why is it unsafe for us? Why is there a rape every... 15 minutes, why is it that girls are allowed to be free? So for you and me, democracy is critical. It's critically important. So for us, we have to keep this democracy alive. So the intersectionality, when it's a Dalit who's a a, uh, set upon, I have a right and I have an obligation to speak. When there is an atrocity on, on any kind of religious group, it's my obligation to speak. And that's only when I speak in this intersectionality to for all the various people, will people come to me when as a woman, I speak for my rights. So it's the understanding of the interrelatedness of human beings. And that's why democracy is very, very important. Thank you, ma'am. Anag has a question to ask you, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Ma'am, my question is that what inspired you and gave you the courage to leave, resign as an IAS officer and get inclined towards social work? And also, are you satisfied with the RTI, the working of the RTI after the years of its existence? Firstly, I left the IAS because, you know, they are, we are all temperamentally very different people. And I wanted to see the beginning and the middle of, and the end of everything. And in the IAS, you're transferred and posted every two years. So one, one is the logic of my work. The second is that I wanted to work only with people who were underprivileged. And in a government posting, it is not necessarily so. And the third is bureaucracy normally is only for the status quo. It doesn't work for real change. So for these three reasons, I left the IAS. Uh, and also corruption. I saw a lot of corruption uh, in the IAS and I felt disheartened by it. Well, probably that's one reason why I fought for corruption, I fought against corruption and fought those many battles because I understood how it destroys so many lives. See, the right to information, the system has failed the right to information. But what do I mean by that? That they are weakening the commissions, they are weakening the rules of the commission, they are frightened by the right to information. I have been told my nephew went to Lahul and Spiti and there, they are right to information act uh, workers there, I mean, who have nothing to do with me. I don't know them. They don't know me. Uh, they are using the RTI. RTI lagadenge has become a kind of a threat when they are faced with corruption or with, uh, with uh, arbitrary power, use of arbitrary power. But there are problems always with every law. And, but this law is the most used law. And I hope Bajahat will say a few things at the end of this, that it's the most used law in the world. Nowhere in the world do 60 to 80 lakh people use it every year. Not even the most literate country. It is the country which has, the, the law has become part of everyone's political being, of their public persona. They will if they think of the RTI as an alternative so very often. So that's why whether you're men or women or children, even children have filed RTIs asking questions. So it, it's very, very critically important. And the most important of all is that it's brought back what was the era of reason, which we attribute to Nehru many times because he talked so much about science and scientific thinking, but scientific thinking is what? Rationality and reason. And how does reason and rationality begin? By asking a question. So it is teaching us how to ask a correct question within a legal frame and wait for correct answers. So it's giving us basic life education and there it hasn't failed. But in terms of commissions being inefficient and not performing, in terms of you know, pending cases, in cases where penalty is not imposed, there are many, many problems. But these problems have not decreased the number of RTI users. Even 80, 90 people have been killed because they've used RTI. Even that has not been a deterrent. 
and their families are continuing, for, continuing to fight for the members of their families they have lost, but also for the RTI. None of them say you should get rid of the RTI. So it is like saying, you cannot say I don't want truth or I don't want uh, honesty, I don't want integrity. So it is like that, it's become a basic tenet now of our political life. Thank you, Mom. Welcome. I now request Harshita to ask her question. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you for this wonderful lecture and it will be enriching for all of us. Uh, ma'am, my question to you is that I read an article that quoted you. Everyone calls it an elite service. I always felt the discourse should be a bit better than it was. I was shocked to find people boasting about their achievements in corruption. Uh, ma'am, I'm a civil servant aspirant and I believe that you have been a role model for, for bringing a change in the country. I believe that corruption uh, has its roots from the people and we can bring a change in the system. So like, what is your take on it? Uh, like the aspiring youth, uh, like that looks, uh, uh, that looks up to you. Uh, corruption is a strangely equal uh, phenomenon. It is not people who are corrupt. It's not the civil service alone which is corrupt. Even the judiciary is corrupt, even accounts and auditors are corrupt, uh, professors are corrupt. Uh, corruption is a uniform leveler in this country. You can find corruption everywhere. I'm not saying that categories, the whole category is corrupt. You understand what I mean? Corruption is everywhere. So it's not people who are corrupt. The most important thing, and Bajat led a very a life of great probity and integrity in the IAS. He's not corrupt, of course. And more than that, he's been a person who's immensely contributed to the development of India. So you don't have to leave the service. I left, as I said, because of temperament. But corruption, where there is secrecy, there is corruption. Where there's transparency, it cannot be. That's the principle which led us to fight for the RTI. Because if you say, mera tankha itna hai, and ye lo mera kagas dekh lo, tumhe acha nahi lagta hai, so you go and fight the authorities who fix my salary. But my salary is X. Nobody will be upset. But when they see disproportionate income in the house, then in, in relation to a meager salary we draw, then obviously, and I don't mean IAS officers when I made that statement, I meant the bureaucracy. And strangely enough, in our mind, we just think of only the elite service. But the elite service almost also had its drawbacks. When I went back to the IAS Academy, I found it quite shocking that there was a price for every male IAS officer in the marriage market in terms of dowry. They told me unofficially that in Bihar, it's X crores. In UP, it's X crore, Y crores. In Tamil Nadu, it's Z crores. In uh, other parts of India, it's A crores and B crores and C crores. So, but a woman, who's going to give you money to get married to you? We are still victims of our social system. You will have to give the money and you'll have to provide the dowry or so your parents will think. Though they're giving away the capital with the interest because we are the capital and the interest is also going along with us. How many of us are willing to fight it? So I felt that the impetus to fight these things in the, within the service was not strong enough because women IAS officers should have formed a group to fight against dowry, saying that not only will we fight against dowry in our own lives, but for women of India, which simply did not happen. So that is the reason why I said, and of course, it's not IAS officers alone who are corrupt. Some IAS officers are corrupt and you can't uh, say they aren't because some of them have been jailed for corruption recently in the last couple of years or the last decade. But the point is that you have to be, there's a saying in, uh, in, uh, in, in English that you have to be, Julius is, Caesar's wife has to be beyond suspicion. This is said, of course, it's a quotation from Shakespeare, but you have to be beyond suspicion. So you have to have, as a civil servant, just be absolutely beyond suspicion. I'll share the last thing I'll tell you is what I knew, learned from a very eminent and very, a person whom I admired 
one of the most one is one of the most important people in my life was a civil servant called Mr. S. R. Shankaran, who was uh, in the Andhra Kader, and he never closed his door. And I used to say to him, Mr. Shankaran, you never close your door. He said, that's the door to corruption. <laughs> if I leave, close my door, my darban will take money. My so-and-so will take money. My PA will take money from even people who want to come and see me. So my doors are always open. So it's in every gesture and every fact that you can actually bring a much better country into being. So the IAS by itself is not bad. I mean, I have so many friends in the IAS and I'm not, I'm not at all... Uh, I'm proud of being having been part of the service for seven years. I don't hide it under a bushel. But the point is there are many ways to achieve things. And there are many ways in which you can fight for integrity and probity. My way was different. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Welcome. I now request Dr. Neetu Agarwal to put forward her question. Uh, I think we must ask ma'am whether she is comfortable, like uh, can we continue and uh, question answer round for like, can we take two, three more or uh, should we? Of course you can. Please do take two, three more. Thank you so much because yeah. students are really interested. Thank you. Please do take two, three more. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ma'am. I just wanted to know what is your take on the uh, present government refusing to disclose the accounts of the PM Cares Fund, saying that it is not a public authority, to which I think every common man uh, donated uh, sums of money and to which uh, people would have continued to donate had it not been for the government refusing to disclose the accounts. And also uh, your take on how to make the RTI Act more robust and strong. Um, the PM Cares Fund, and I've said it so many times over and over again, has absolutely no business not to be transparent. Any public money, any public money accrued from people or from any other source must, including electoral bonds, I think, must be made public. And to say that PM Care will not even be under the AGs of the Controller and Auditor General makes me deeply suspicious. Because if anyone says, I will not disclose what I have, my first assumption is that there's something to hide. If the prime minister was indeed interested in his probity and integrity, he would have made the PM Care Fund public. By not making it public, he is actually joining the ranks of people who are in the area of grey, of whose probity and integrity will always be suspicious. In terms of making the uh, RTI more rigorous, it's by more and more usage of the RTI and more and more people penetrating into the layers beyond just filing the RTI into strengthening systems all over the country because now RTI is as widely spread as the Panchayati Raj system is. You have it everywhere. And, but more basically, the robustness of the RTI should be protected by protecting Article 19 of the Constitution which is the right to, right, to, uh, right to freedom of expression. RTI activists, when they are quiet about the right to freedom of expression, I'm really worried because if Article 19 is now being used or misused to curb freedom of expression of very honest people who want to ask questions of power, then what will happen when RTI becomes one of the tools that they're going to get rid of? I'm worried. So the biggest rigorousness of the RTI actually is the rigorousness of the right to freedom of expression today. And I would say, and I would also like to quote from uh, uh, Jerome, uh, Jeremy Cronin, a very famous uh, communist poet from South Africa, when he said, uh, democracy is what, and I would say right to information is what, speaking truth to power, speaking truth to power, making truth powerful and power truthful. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. With this, we come to an end of the question and answer session. Now I request Dr. Kati, uh, Krishna to please come forward and give uh, the vote of thanks.
Good afternoon, Honorable Ma'am Aruna Roy, and the guest of honor, Mr. Vajahat Habibullah, and members of Habibullah family, distinguished guests, respected Ma'am Vikaji and Ms. Sethi, members of the managing committee, respected principal, dear colleagues, and my dear students. It is a special day in the history of the college as today we have hosted the first memorial lecture in the loving memory of the founder president of the college, Begum Hamida Habibullah, on her 104th birth anniversary. On behalf of the management, staff, and students of Avad Girls Degree College, it is my proud privilege and honor to propose formal vote of thanks. First of all, I would like to extend my most sincere thanks to the esteemed speaker of the day, Ms. Aruna Roy. Thank you, ma'am, for such empowering speech, for sharing your experiences and enlightening us with your invaluable insights. Your life is very inspiring for our young minds. Thank you for teaching us the lessons of life of inquiring, questioning, and asking, which is very important for empowerment. Thank you for this very thought-provoking and insightful talk and sharing with us your ideas and expertise. It was indeed a pleasure to listen to you. I place on record our deepest sense of appreciation. Thank you very much for being with us today. I would also like to express my heartfelt thanks to the guest of honor, Mr. Vajahat Habibullah and Habibullah family for gracing the occasion. We thank you from the bottom of our heart. I would also like to express my heartfelt gratitude to Ma'am Vikaji, President Managing Committee for blessing us with her presence. The program cannot be complete without you without your blessings and inspiring words. I extend my heartfelt thanks to Ms. Sethi, Vice President of Managing Committee for gracing the occasion. We are delighted to have you here, ma'am. I'm grateful to the members of Managing Committee for taking time out in being part of this glorious day. We are grateful to Professor Nishi Pandey, Manager Secretary of the College, for her guidance in all our events. We are thankful to Dr. Chaturvedi, principal of the college for her constant support in all our endeavors. We offer a sincere thanks to all the distinguished, most valued invited guests, student council and the student body for their presence throughout. I take this opportunity to thank all the teachers, and special thanks to a very dedicated and motivated organizing team, which had been the backbone of the event. Special thanks to the media for covering the event. Thank you all once again for making the program a success. Now may I request all the guests and participants to switch on their cameras so that we can take a group photograph. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you once again. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a wonderful morning, and I can't tell you how privileged I feel thank to have you. delivered this memorial lecture. Thank you, Jahat. Thank you, thank Aruna, for having joined us. And thank you, Zareen and Maji. Thank you.